Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Vanessa Dunn-Guyton, and I am the proud founder and executive director of Hush No More. Hush No More focuses on those hush topics that organizations and families and communities have a hard time discussing. So sexual assault, domestic violence, sex trafficking, child sexual abuse, incest, all of those conversations that families deal with on the regular, but we don't discuss. So we are on another day of Hush No More Champions, where I spotlight survivors in our communities who are doing some amazing things. And I am truly honored today to bring in Miss Mary Knight. She is phenomenal. And she's going to have a great conversation with us tonight because we're going to talk about spiritual rituals and the KKK as it relates to child sexual abuse. And so it's one of those topics that are difficult. So if you have a hard time, this is our trigger warning. This may be a little hard for you to hear. We will try to keep it a little mainstream, but sometimes it just triggers you when we don't know that it will. So remember that we always have free counseling. Free counseling is available. You can reach out to us for you and your family at no cost to you. So remember that if you're ever triggered, Maybe there's some work that we could still do as it relates to counseling. So, Mary, welcome today. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Introduce yourself to our audience. Mary Knight, I'm, I have a really good life now. That's the first thing I want to say. I do, um, I hike um, and I do yoga. I'm happily married. I got married in 2010 um, and I do respite foster care. So foster kids come and stay with us for a couple of days to give their full-time foster parents a break. Um, I I just, I really have a good life now, uh, but I am a survivor of extreme abuse. Okay. Where do you live? I live in Bellingham, Washington. I can see the mountains in Canada right now. I, it's far north Washington state, north of Seattle. Oh, that's what, no. I have been to Washington State and it's absolutely beautiful. And so I can say that. So you live in a really nice part of the country. So oh, I am happy that we can actually do this via StreamYard so that we can actually have a conversation because if it wasn't for social media, I would have never met you and actually had great conversations about some things that have been going on with you in your life and how you just overcame so much. So first I wanted to say thank you for joining us. I am so honored to have this difficult conversation with you and that you're in a great place, a healthy place to be able to have this discussion. So thank you for joining us tonight. So thank you. <laughs> All right, so we talked about earlier how your life started out, but what triggered you to even start on this journey? I think God got me ready in a number of ways um, to remember. But the phenomena with recovered memories is that you, you, that your mind allows you to be safe by not remembering for a period of time. If I had always remembered my abuse by my parents, I wouldn't have wanted to eat anything they fed me. But I certainly couldn't have made A's in school. You know, I was a good student. And so I only remembered the horrific abuse while it was happening. Even as a child, I didn't, I didn't have conscious awareness of the abuse except for while it was happening. Wow. And then when I was um, in my 30s, I, did, I worked toward more healing. I, I was able to see like my grandfather was an alcoholic. So I got some healing around um, adult children of alcoholic. I, um, I did some took a class on codependency, did a different reading. So I was doing things to get more well. And then when I was 37, my father's sister disclosed to him, to him and my mother and said that uh, there was generational abuse that it went back she said she had been sexually abused by their grandparents 
And my father and mother's response was just to say, well, she's crazy and we'll never see her again, which is especially odd because my mother and my aunt had been college roommates. They'd been really close. And so I talked to my aunt and she didn't tell me that I had been a victim of child abuse. She told me I had witnessed other children being abused. I just knew it was true. And that's when I, um, I was in marriage counseling with my ex-husband at that time. And I just used the counselor that he and I was seeing. She did hypnosis. And I wanted to know as soon as possible what happened and who did it. Because I needed to know who I needed to protect my children from. So I had hypnosis. I had five hypnosis sessions. I um, recorded them on my little audio recorder because I just wanted to make sure that she didn't ask any leading questions or anything. And so I still had those audio recordings and I used them in my film. I made a documentary about my journey. It's Am I Crazy? My Journey to Determine if My Memories Were True, which I know that my, I, I already knew my memories were true before I made it because that's what I had believed for 20 years. But I gave, I, I, I made myself re-examine them and just be sure and did that on camera. So that's what my film, uh, the, the film I made. Um, and recovered memories, it's, we know this now. Um, when I remembered in 1993, we didn't know as much about recovered memories. But now there's um, neuroscience. There's a neuroscientist um, who was in my film, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, who has, there, there's studies that have been done. We know that that's how our brains protect us. And we've known it for a long time with, um, well, you're in military with, um, uh, in combat. We've known that there is such a thing as delayed recall. So I wanted you to really talk about that because a lot of times people will ask, why didn't you report it? Why didn't you say anything? Why didn't you tell anybody sooner? So they don't realize that a lot of times we don't remember the trauma, right? You just don't remember. And then there's something that recalls, triggers it and it comes back, something happens. And so like for you, it was your aunt that started you down this, this journey. And so I'm glad that you actually started recalling, even though it's a lot it's difficult at times to do. I'm glad I didn't recall when I was younger. Now when um, you were younger, yeah. When I, see, when I see people who have that continuous memory, their adult life is sometimes not as, uh, like I already had a master's degree in social work when I remembered. I was doing forensic social work. I, um, I've testified in court on child custody cases over a hundred times and I probably had testified maybe 20 times or so when I recalled. So I had the skill of being able to ask myself the same questions I would ask in a forensic interview about the validity of, of what I remembered. I, I had, I had confidence. I had, um, I was financially able to be separate from my parents who when they died were multimillionaires. Um, and so I, um, I was at a, a good place. And it wasn't just that it, I was triggered by my aunt remembering because I had already known that my cousin remembered. I, I'm sad to say I, when she started saying it was other family members and not just her father, when it was her father, I was fine with, oh yeah, yeah, she was incested by her father. But when she said there were other family members, I broke contact with her. I just was not ready to know this was true yet. Yeah. And uh, so I think that I'm a very spiritual person and other people may use different terms, but I think God had gotten me ready to remember uh, the abuse. I was at a place where I could handle it psychologically. I, I consider it the gift of delayed recall because without it, I wouldn't have the life I do now. But then, uh, yeah, my aunt remembered, uh, my aunt told me at that point, I had three cousins who remembered. So I had four family members 
who had mem memories that when I remember something, I could call one of them and they could say, oh yeah, I had a memory like that. Yeah, um, if they did, they didn't tell me the memories I had because that I couldn't verify that way. But then afterwards, you know, I could, and that was really helpful. Um, now one more cousin has remembered. So five family members with similar memories, they're all recovered memories. Like All recovered. But most people, you know, don't have that. And so I'm not trying to say that you need to have verification from someone else in order to believe your memory, because in the end, you know it because the deepest part of you says, this is true. This is real. Yeah. When I had a recovered memory, I knew that it was real. Like I freaked out and everything. So people ask me all the time, why didn't you say anything? I didn't remember. <laughs> yeah. so, and, and we had that conversation over Facebook, right. actually, when you were talking about your memory. And I was like, something similar happened to me. So we were able to connect on that. But how I want to know about your family. How did you grow up? How how was your mother and father? It was a complete double life. Um, complete. Um, my mother was like this 50s housewife, uh, homemaker, college educated. Um, she had a degree in home act. She was excellent cook, excellent um, seamstress. Oh, she she made some really fashionable clothes for me. Um, I was one of the best dressed kids in, in school. She was good at many things, but um, she was, uh, and I don't know if she had, I mean, she, I'm sure with DID, dissociative identity disorder, I don't know how much she separated it in her mind, but yeah, they were, she could not have been a worse mother. Yeah. And, and my father was um, a song leader. He um, uh, led really spirited music. Um, he, um, and, and he was very abusive uh, to me. He was a uh, he produced child pornography. Um, I have met another victim of um, another person he victimized in the child pornography. Um, he was an excellent. Um, I'm like my lighting's not real good tonight. <laughs> he had professional lights. I mean, he he um, was a good photographer, cinematographer. So people would never. Imagine because both your parents were in the church three times a week, three times a week, singing, leading leaders in the church. Oh, yeah, yeah, leaders in the church. And sometimes people hide behind the church, right? Yeah. It's like this perfect image for people to be saying that I'm in the church, I praise God, you can trust me, and it, it makes them sit like high up on this pedestal that we don't really understand when yeah. the curtains are pulled back from them. Yeah. Yeah. So that was your family. It was, it was. And I've come to believe that child pornography that includes a church setting probably can sell, sells for more money. I mean, you, you see what I mean? There what are mean? people who specifically would want to buy child pornography if it has a pulpit in it if it has a Sunday school classroom. I mean, it's just, it's so evil. And since my parents had keys to the church building, they could use it in horrible ways like that. So they actually brought children to the church or did they use you? Um, they used me. The, okay. They used me, um, but, um, and I believe other children on church property, but they definitely, I, I'm careful to only talk about what I myself witnessed. Right. And I myself was victimized in child pornography on church property, um, video that was taken on church property uh, photography. And um, uh, also, you know, in other settings too. Um, and um, I did witness abuse of other children um, as well. And I did witness, um, I did witness murder. Uh, and um, I, that's something I could, I could read from to tell more about that. My parents used church 
as a way to hide their KKK involvement, and they use KKK involvement as a way to distribute pornography, child pornography. I don't believe that everyone in the KKK is a child abuser, um, but I do believe that people who dehumanize other people as much as white supremacists do, um, that among that segment of people, you're going to, there's going to be more um, pedophiles. And I have talked to other people who are uh, were victimized in um, KKK gatherings. So the church and the KKK was simultaneous for your family. Like they went hand oh, yeah, hand. they were involved in both at the same time. Yes, yes. But I also want to say really clearly the church I went to, um, which I actually have footage of that church property uh, uh, in my uh, film, Am I Crazy? But um, they, they did let me take footage on, on church property. But there were good people at that church. There were really good people at that church. It wasn't everyone at the church. And religion has been a really good part of my life. I noticed, you know, I, I posted the uh, what the, your poster about uh, telling that tonight I would tell about ritual and ritual that I would tell about religious abuse, ritual abuse and and KKK, uh, child sexual abuse. And I also posted um, I've started attending Ebenezer Baptist Church via Zoom uh, and I, I posted something about it, you know? So, because, I mean, the music, it reminds me of the music I had in my childhood church and um, there were good things I got. There are good things I get from religion. So I'm not opposed to religion. I'm, I'm not upset with God. Although I will say that I think God is big enough and strong enough that it's fine with God to be angry at him, her. So um, I have been angry and I, I, I think God can handle, my, the God I worship can handle our anger. And I love that because sometimes people turn away from God, from their faith after trauma. So yeah, I love that yeah. you've embraced that. You've embraced that. I still love God. I still love going to church, even though you had some bad experiences in the church. Yes. Yeah, I like that. That, that means a lot to me because it gives people hope. You know, as I always say that we don't talk about this enough in the church. People go to church when they're hurting, right? When they've been through some things, but we don't have the conversations. And so I'm real big on going to churches and having this discussion because you never know who is being abused in your congregation. Yes, yes. And, and I know you're putting this out on YouTube and other formats. And I just would encourage churches to bring this into their churches and, and let people see this um, because churches need to protect themselves in that, you know, child pornographers like to use church property. I mean, they just and you you need to church should be safe. And it, it wasn't for me. And uh, you need to be willing to ask people questions. And anyone who has a key to your church, if someone's listening and you're, you're a church leader, anyone who has a key to your church should, um, should be willing to be investigated. Yeah. yeah. I had a pastor one time tell me that he didn't want to encourage his children to come and talk to him about if they were being touched, if it was some type of abuse going on because he was a mandatory reporter. And that meant that he would be reporting on his members. And um, I said, don't you think that they should be? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, and he had to think about it. He thought about it. And I'm hoping that I left an impact on him. Yeah. Because he did think about it. We must talk to our children, no matter what setting they're in. Oh, because it yeah. might have been different for you. You just never know yeah. what's yeah. going on with our kids. Yeah. So. And that's one reason I didn't remember when I was younger, because, you know, you, you don't want to say something like that about your own parent. 
Yeah. And I'm afraid if I had been younger, I would have harmed myself because it was all I could do at age 37 to acknowledge that my father had done that. And really, I think if I hadn't had children, I might not have done it. I mean, I wouldn't have done it for all the money in the world. I wouldn't have done it to say that my father is, uh, is a child abuser. And, but I had to call and confront my father because I have, ch I had children and, and I have children and children just, I, I'm just a lifelong child advocate. That's what I did as a social worker for 23 years. That's what I do as a filmmaker. I'm an advocate for survivors of child abuse and for the children of today. Um, so, you know, sometimes you forget that it's you're having to say this about your own parent. And it's really hard. And I also would say that people who are not wanting to say this publicly, that's fine. Right. I'm out here saying it publicly. I, I, as you can see, my hair is gray. I, this is at a time in my life that it's safe for me to do that. Don't push yourself to do it before it's the right time for you. I get people coming to me. One of the people who came to me and said, I don't feel like I can talk about my past as a, uh, uh, she said, as a survivor of human trafficking, and uh, she said, but I'm starting to talk about that, but she's she was a pastor, and she said, I'm afraid my congregants can't handle me talking about the ritual abuse. So she was not public about the ritual abuse, and I mean, that's sad. She's a pastor. She's, you know, and, but that's also okay. If you don't, there's times it's been hard for me that I did go public, so um uh it was harder for me to become a foster parent because i had gone public which is just you know but it was it was harder to go through the interview process now i am but um uh a foster parent um but there are things that your life is harder so don't push yourself about that and if someone wants to talk to me and i i know you offer the free counseling with your service and i think that's great if someone wants to talk to me personally about my experience I am willing to talk to any survivor for a one-time phone call. And uh, my contact information is on my website, marynightproductions.com. Um, you can email me and we can set up a phone call. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's important for people to be able to reach out to someone who have had a similar experience. So thank you so very much for that because that's important. Um, I do want you to define what is your defini definition of spiritual abuse? Well, spiritual abuse would be any type of abuse that affects you spiritually. I don't think it's only child sexual abuse. It could be, um, well, I think I would include, you know, sermons that just make everyone go away feeling guilty and not uplifted, you know. I mean, that's spiritual abuse. You're getting that from the pulpit. But mine went much further than that. I mean, I, I do think there were times that from the pulpit, they use things in sermons that would trigger me that would, um, uh, and to this day, I, I, I will not listen to a sermon on the crucifixion. Um, I'll leave. Um, and, um, but well, so spiritual abuse can be anything. Mine was extreme and um, mine involved having to watch a man be put on a cross. So um, if you want, I could go ahead and read. Please, please, because I, I think that that was important. Your writing is very important to you, and I'm, I want you to be able to share that. OK. So this is, well, it seemed like a Sunday drive. I was eight years old. I had on a pretty dress, white lacy socks, and shiny shoes that were only for wearing to church. We stopped and pick up, picked up the medical doctor we called Dr. D. I don't know how far we drove. It seemed like a long way to an eight-year-old. I leaned against the car door and fell asleep. Somewhere out in the country, we stopped at a shaft. A black man invited us in. 
He may have been one of Dr. D's patients, or he might have been someone my parents knew from their church connections. Once inside, my father and Dr. D pulled out their guns. I saw two women. My father tied these women to chairs in the kitchen. Boards already painted white were taken out of the station wagon and a cross was erected inside the shack. The man's arms and legs were strapped to it. There was a little girl in the room who was exactly the same size as me. She was cute with tiny braids all over her head. Her dress was clean and ironed. I remember thinking someone must really love her. One gun was pointed at the little girl's head and the other gun was pointed at my head. The man was told that if he would pretend to die willingly, as Jesus did, his little girl would be spared. My mother held our eight millimeter camera. I knew that there were people who liked to see movies of murders because I had already been made to lay motionless after beatings and pretend to die on camera. Apparently, people who like to see black men tied to crosses also like to see white girls with their clothes off. I had to do things to the man while he was on the cross. I stared at the man's face. He was dead. I don't know whether he died from hanging on the cross or from something they made him eat. I was not left to wonder how the little girl died. As soon as the man took his last breath, my father shot the little girl in the head. The women screamed. I screamed too. Dr. D and my father moved quickly. They set the shack on fire. My mother tried to grab my hand, but I did not want to leave with the bad people. I wanted to stay with the good people and die. I broke free and ran back into the burning shack. One of the women screamed at me to leave saying, little girl, go so you can grow up and tell what happened. At my next counseling session, I carefully read what I'd written in my journal about the event. I was relieved when my counselor thought it might be symbolic. I called a cousin that evening and asked if he had a similar memory. He said, no, I signed, I sigh, I breathed a sigh of relief. Then he said, the black men I saw crucified on crosses had no family. They were homeless. For years after the memory surfaced, I was obsessed with trying to spur a murder investigation. I contacted police departments in Seattle and surrounding cities. Sometimes I was put on hold, but at the end I was told there's simply not enough information for any type of investigation. There's no statute of limitations on murder, but you have to at least know where it happened. I considered hiring a private investigator to see if there were records of the death of a family unit that included a father, a little girl, and two women. Then I realized that it could have been unrelated homeless people who were lured to the shack with the promise of food or medical care. I recalled the eyes of the man whose body I was forced to touch. Was he someone who would pretend to die on a cross willingly, even if the child whose life would be spared was not his own child? Was the woman with the kind voice not asking for a favor from me when she said, little girl, go so you can grow up and tell what happened? It occurred to me all these years later that she was not asking me to tell her story. She did not want anything from me. She was using her dying breath to plead with me not to give up on life. With parents so evil as mine, in order to want to go on living, I would need a purpose, a reason to go on. Telling a story is a purpose that even a traumatized little girl can quickly comprehend. People ask why my parents and other relatives did such horrible things as though I am some sort of authority on evil. I concentrate on things that make a difference to me, like how I can quit feeling guilty about crimes committed by my parents. And I remind myself that it is mothers who give life and that when my young body wanted to die, it was given new life by the words of a black woman. Sometimes I allow myself to forget I am white. 
And I pray that before I die, I can live in a society that is reflective of a truth I have known since I was a little girl, a truth that is both indisputable and somehow possible to ignore, the truth that Black lives matter. Thank you. I am truly honored. When I read it the first time, I was just blown away. I am truly honored to be able to hear you read it because it has a different meaning for me. It makes me feel like I needed to meet somebody that was courageous and was going to stand up for others, speaking from your own experiences and not worrying about the fear of retaliation or something happening to you. And so thank you for sharing that and reading that. And I think that it will really make a difference. And hopefully this video goes around the world so people can really hear what is happening, what has happened, and how we can really make a change. So thank you for sharing that. Last summer, I just felt compelled, like God was saying, you have got to write it. You have got to write it now. And um, yeah, thank you for letting me share it in this video. Was that part of healing for you? Oh, well, yeah, it was. You know, I was afraid that Black people would, would not like me because of what my parents did. And so this is, this is the sixth podcast I've been on with a Black host. It's, you know, it, it's just has been like, I mean, I, I was a little girl. I, I didn't do it. Yeah, I'm not mad at you. I am so proud. Like when I tell you, I am honored, Mary, that you speak up and you tell your truth and you're not fearful anymore. Like you've gotten to a place that you are deciding to hush no more. So I'm not mad at you. I think it's very courageous and I'm just so proud. I have some comments in the chat box that we could probably go to. Ashley said, I love that as well. She was talking about, um, when you were talking about your love for God, because God was a huge part of my healing and he continues to be a motivating force in my life. I applaud you for the courage to speak your truth. That's Ashley. Tanya said, thank you for sharing your story. Um, Ashley just responded, that was chilling and brought me to tears from your story. Meredith said, bless you for sharing your story. And Elizabeth said, thank you for sharing your story as well. So, they're really appreciating you coming forward and speaking up, you know, and it means a lot to people that you're doing it. Have you ever been fearful of like retaliation from the KKK or from the church? Do you ever feel, or from family members? Well, I, I have, uh, yeah, there are family members who, um, I mean, they don't, yeah, I, I don't hear from them, but they, they, it still hurts that there's family members who call me crazy. It's, it still hurts. Um, and I, I've gotten to where it doesn't hurt as much. And I've noticed with going public, and I didn't know this before going public, and the people who aren't going public, please listen, because please learn from this. I thought most people didn't believe me, but it's most people who are, the people who don't believe me are almost all related to my perpetrators. I mean, almost everyone believes me. People related to my perpetrators don't. And before you go public, you think most people don't believe you because you're hearing from people you're related to. Um, but now I know that most people do believe me. Um, retaliation by the KKK, no, I haven't, um, no, I haven't been concerned about that. Um, uh, I, I have gone back to the church that, um, where, um, uh, I mean, this, this didn't happen at a church, but I have gone back to churches, um, and, um, and people don't like to hear things about church leaders, I will say that. You know, I went back to the, my childhood church while one of my perpetrators was still alive and he, uh, he was still chosen to be an elder after I had been back. They were choosing elders when I went and he still was chosen. 
Um, he was an elder of that church until he died. Um, and, you know, I, I have not, I have not gotten good responses from, um, from churches when I've tried to speak out. Um, and then I've also, but then even with that, when I went back that time, one of the people who I'd known when I was a little girl literally stood by me while I was confronting an abuser. He literally stood right by me. Um, and, and then he took, um, uh, he took, I, he, he, he took, he took his daughter, he was a widow, widower, his wife had died, but he took his daughters and, and granddaughter out to lunch every Sunday and he took me to, so, you know, he, he literally stood by me and then he took me out to lunch. And, um, and so there were good people from that church. Um, when I was a little girl, I just didn't know who they were. And people say, well, why don't you tell someone? Well, you might tell someone it could be the wrong person in it. Yeah. I, it was after I, I mean, since I saw people killed, it was, uh, I, I was afraid for my life as a child. At, now, it always affects me to, to tell. Um, I have an easy day for myself tomorrow because I need to just take care of myself some after I tell. I, I don't want to make it seem like it's easy. Um, and um, I, I'm really glad I made my film because now I can tell without telling. Now I can people can watch my film and then they can talk to me as opposed to me taking an hour or two hours to tell my story. So my, my film's an hour long. It's, um, it's recently been translated into German subtitles. It's someone volunteered to translate it into Polish subtitles. It's in Spanish subtitles and it's in English closed captions. So I try to make that available. The essay I just read is on my website. So there's a lot on my website. One other thing while I'm talking about my website, I want to say about another film I made, which is a PG-13 um, romantic comedy. And it's, it's the twins movie. It's uh, on my website. Um, and I made it because I wanted to share something. When I was a little girl, the church I went to, women weren't allowed to be ministers, but I always, you know, I had this sermon I want to tell. And, um, and I tell it in, in that film, uh, in it, it's identical twin sisters, a nun and a lingerie model trade places because the lingerie model has urgent need for medical treatment. It's pre-Obamacare. So she moves into the convent and poses as her sister and gets medical care. But um, in it, uh, they, they are survivors of abuse. And so the lingerie model comes to have a spiritual awakening while in the convent. She talks to the priest and she asks the priest, where was God when my father messed with me? And he says, I can't know that for you, but for me, what I believe is God was right beside me, holding my hand and crying. And that's what I believe about God. Um, or, you know, some people don't call that spiritual essence God, but yeah. Thank you. You put in my my um, my website, which I'm and then also my Facebook page. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Because I just had a comment asking me um, what was your web, what was your website? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's MaryNightProductions.com. In case some people are listening and and not uh, in front of it, but. Uh, Mary and my last name is spelled L L Knight, like Knight in Shining Armor. So Mary Knight Productions .com. Yeah, you are a Knight in Shining Armor. Thank you. You really are. <laughs> that that is a perfect analogy, a perfect nickname for you. I love that because you really are making a difference and changing lives. You're changing lives with your film, being an advocate, just speaking up, encouraging others to speak up when they're ready. That's so important. Yeah. And yeah. letting people know this is not easy. When I share my story, I have to take a break as well. And mm -hmm. self-care is important. Self-care is very important when you share because mm -hmm. you just never know. You alluded to other people hurting you. 
were there more than one yeah, I was uh, sexually abused by women as well as men. I was um, sexually abused by a female Sunday school teacher in a church that taught that gays would go to hell. Very confusing. Um, I was, um, my film goes into a, a ritualistic type of abuse that I experienced and um, I, 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 ritual abuse is very controversial. Some people say it doesn't happen, but I know what happened to me. And uh, some people define ritual abuse as, and then they say it doesn't happen. Ritual abuse is someone trying to um, worship Satan or worship God by sexually molesting children and that these people who do it aren't pedophiles. Well, people who sexually abuse children are pedophiles. It's, you know, and and so they they define it in this way that's ridiculous, and then they say it doesn't happen. But uh, I know that the things that happened to me happened to other people, um, and the things that I talk about in my film are are done. Uh, I'll I'll give one example: is I was put in a coffin. Um, I mean, how? terrorizing to put a child in a coffin but i was talking to someone else about it and she said you know it's interesting how many survivors of ritual abuse had that experience of being put in a coffin and and so what i'm saying is some of my experiences i talk about and they're common within ritual abuse um that yeah they're common within ritual abuse so people who are who are hearing this and are survivors of ritual abuse who have been discounted i really encourage you to to see my film and um i've been amazed at how many people believe what happened to me when seeing my film um i think sometimes survivors of ritual abuse get afraid of everything and everyone and so they can't tell their story in a way that seems credible because they're afraid of so much. And I'm pleased that I am able to tell. And one way I've done that is I don't, I don't talk about things I don't know. I only talk about things that happen to me first person. Um, and you know, I, what happened for me to have to witness a man being crucified and for me to have to um, do things that would appear in this child pornography. Um, I mean, that's ritualistic abuse and uh, cro crosses being used, sacred um, communion being desecrated. Those are common things that happen in ritual abuse. But to say that the person who does these things is worshiping Satan or is worth worshiping God, you would have to be inside their head to know that. And, and we're not, we don't know what's going on in someone else's head. People have asked me that, did, did your parents think that God was telling them to do this? I, I don't know what my parents were thinking. I, it's, and if I did, I, I couldn't comprehend it. I mean, someone who's good just cannot comprehend that level of evil. And there's no answer. No, there's no yeah. answer. Sometimes people ask you questions that they're never going to get an answer to. Right. Answer right. Yeah. right. And and I think it's important to ask the questions because it's it's a way of relating to God. You know, it's a way of relating to um, the world. If you if people who are um, maybe humanistic and don't believe in God, it's it's a way of coping with life. And everyone has to find their own way. And my way is to just think God was there. That's where God was. God was right there holding my hand and crying. That's where God was. Kim has a question for you. She said, what was the purpose of putting you in the coffin? A scare tactic to keep you from talking? Hmm.
it was a part of being terrorized. And I do encourage to see the film because it's in context to, uh, to that, that I was put in the coffin to, to a larger event. And um, it was all a part of being terrorized. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, I would also say to Kim, I'm, I'm glad to answer her questions. It, it helps if someone sees my film because before talking to me, because then it answers some of the questions. But it's still why my parents did that. I do know that after that ritual that it included being put in the coffin, my father started coming into my room more and, and sexually abusing me. And um, I think he just knew he could because what am I going to say? You know, I mean, I've already been so terrorized. I just think he, my parents said that they would kill us if we told and um, I believed them. And, you know, after they'd said that to me when I was young, then that being reiterated, I was nine when I was put in the coffin. Um, I, I, I believed it and yeah, so um, it, it was safety for my dad that he could do anything to me. And the abuse did get different after that, after I was gone. I can't even imagine being in a coffin when I have a hard time with darkness. Like I have a real hard time with darkness. So I'm like, oh, when you said it, it's like, I don't know how I would have felt. That's when you really need God by your side. Like when you say God was there with you, God would have had to be there with me in that process. And so I truly believe that's where your faith stems from. God was with you and knew that one day you will be able to share your story and be able to encourage others, right? And, and bring, raising awareness, raising awareness to the level that a lot of us can never understand because we haven't been in your shoes. So a lot of awareness. Do you have anything else that you want to share with us, Mary? We're at the end of the hour. I'll yeah. just, I, I love to get people, uh, if people contact me, I have an email list. My next thing I'm going to be using the email list is I'm writing a memoir. And so I'd like to let you know when that comes out. And um, I, it's going to be a collection of essays, which will include the essay I read today. I'm writing an essay about my marriage. My husband's not, he's a very private person. He's like, really you know but um i'm i'm uh i think there are some things that are different um and some things that are very much the same about being married to a survivor and so i'm going to include not just things about our wonderful marriage but things about hard hard things within our marriage and um i'm including an essay on the um benefits of delayed recall um I'm including a short story about my um, a fictional story that has to do with my angel connection with my mother. Um, so um, I, I love for people to get in contact with me and um, I often am able to provide things free to survivors who can't easily afford it. If a survivor wants to see my film, and can't uh, easily afford it. And I stress easily, let me know and I will let you see my film free. Um, and um, I'll, I'm gonna try to make my memoir the same way. So it's good to get in contact with me. Um, and uh, I don't, it's venues like this where I let get word about, about my uh, work. So, um, I like to make the most of that. Thank you so much. Kim said she literally have no words and you are truly a strong woman. So thank you for answering her question. That's not always an easy thing to do to be able to answer questions. So thank you for that. Oh yeah, I'm, and I'm glad to answer questions. Absolutely glad to answer questions. Yeah. So after doing this show, right? How do you feel after having this conversation with me? You know, I feel so comfortable with you, Vanessa. I've just got to say this is, I just feel so comfortable with you. 
and you you're just a wonderful host so um yeah i'm feeling good and thank you for checking in on me good good i always want someone that sits down with me and pours out to feel that they can trust me and that this is a safe space i think that's important that's important for all survivors even when someone tells a friend or a family member they need to feel that it's a safe space and that's yes. important very important that there's no judgment mm -hmm. there's no judgment you know so i truly love you and i thank you for who you are and for everything that you have done and that you're going to continue doing once you finish your memoir please let me know so that i can share it right so i can share it because people will be interested in hearing what you have to say because you have so much to tell and we only get like snippets of it only get a little please reach out to her she speaks she also does um documentary screening so she is awesome so i would love for you to invite her out because she is truly a survivor advocate that is making changes in our community and i'm truly honored to be able to just sit with her for this one hour